Independent documentaries have been a rich source of information to the public. Let's take a look at the documentary Hot Coffee and how corporations are taking control of the judicial branch of government for financial gain at the expense of the weak. The movie Hot Coffee only presents the trial lawyer and injured person's perspective, but there are two sides to this issue. First, let's take a look at the opposing viewpoint, which is called tort reform. Tort reform proponents want to limit lawsuits and the money that can be received in lawsuits. Their argument is eloquently communicated by a well-respected surgeon, Ben Carson, and I'll let him give the argument for tort reform. Physicians are the backbone of our healthcare system and deserve to practice in an environment free of unnecessary frivolous, costly, and time-consuming lawsuits. Therefore, it is essential that we move forward with common sense tort reform to protect our physicians from predatory trial lawyers. Patients who are injured deserve to be fully compensated and made whole, but massive, unpredictable damage awards are the central driver of unaffordable medical malpractice premiums which drive many doctors out of business. For example, our university-affiliated hospitals and federally qualified health centers have special protections against excessive litigation. In 2002, 40% of Texas counties did not have a pediatrician and over half did not have an obstetrician. The following year, the Texas legislature enacted sweeping tort reform over the vigorous opposition of the trial bar. Opponents of reform made outrageous claims about denying rights to the poor and middle class. All have proven false. Since 2003, Medical malpractice premiums have declined by more than half in Texas, and the number of doctors in the state has doubled. Most importantly, access to care has increased, particularly in previously underserved areas like the Rio Grande Valley and in underserved specialties like OBGYN and neurosurgery. Texas did it right. America's innovative, job-creating, and exporting medical device and biotech companies also deserve not to be targets of frivolous litigation. Reforming our tort reform system to favor doctors over trial lawyers will make health care more affordable and accessible for all Americans and is one of the best ways to save our health care. In the movie Hot Coffee, Susan Saladoff makes the following four complaints against the tort reform movement. One, the insurance industry passed tort reform measures with a false and misleading public relations campaign. Two, caps on damage awards hurt the weakest of society and only benefit the wealthy businesses and insurance companies. Three, donations from big business are hijacking judicial elections. And four, forced arbitration clauses are stripping individual rights to jury trials. In this episode, we will discuss the insurance industry's misleading public relations media campaign called tort reform. The role of the judiciary is to uphold the rule of law and to provide a forum to resolve disputes and to test and enforce laws in a fair and reasonable manner. The power to bring a lawsuit is an important check and balance, and it's an effective weapon for the weak to use against the wealthy and a powerful way to protect its rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Hot Coffee explores how the insurance companies and the wealthy erode that right. An 81-year-old woman has been awarded $2.9 million after she sued McDonald's. It wasn't like the McDonald's employee took the coffee, threw it on her. Who brings these frivolous lawsuits? All kinds of people. People that are jackpot justice oriented. The media in corporate America did a masterful job. Mrs. Liebeck became a joke. Businesses use a number of devices to keep the public out of the courts. In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. I was burned so severely that uh, they didn't think I would live. Are you going to show me the burns? What? <laughs> yes, if I saw injuries like that, I would definitely uh, take a different view of it. Attorney and director of Hot Coffee, Susan Saladoff, discusses the McDonald's case and the factually misleading public relations campaign of tort reform put forth by the insurance industry. In this next video, she appears by Skype for an interview online, so please forgive the time lag. 
know, so much money has been spent by large corporate interests through the media to convince the public that our court system is broken. Because if people think that the court system, our civil courts, are not working and that there are too many frivolous lawsuits, you know, jackpot justice, lawsuit lottery, then people are willing to reform it, which has become this sort of term of art, reform, as if it's something good for us. When in fact, in this particular case, reform means we give up our rights as average citizens and corporations get to make more money. Because the only place that we have to hold wrongdoers accountable is in the civil courts. And particularly large corporations, when they make products that harm us, when they dump pollution into our streams, the only place that average citizens can say, no, this isn't right, and you have to compensate us for the harm that you've done to us, is in our court system. And the corporations figured that out. In fact, Karl Rove was really the mastermind behind this years ago when Governor Bush was, or when President Bush was running for, to be governor of Texas. And he realized that he could galvanize money from all over the country into Texas if corporations can limit their liability in the court system. Everybody wants to talk about the words, the words frivolous lawsuit because th those words have been fed to us time and time again through television commercials, media ads, print, all of this. It's been repeated so many times that it sort of flows off of our, of, of our tongues. Um, you know, most people think that the McDonald's coffee case, the woman who spilled coffee and sued McDonald's, was the most ridiculous or frivolous lawsuit until they see the film Hot Coffee. So um, most people think, oh, this woman was driving the car, she spilled coffee on herself, she wasn't very injured, and she won millions of dollars. So what really happened is this was a 79-year-old woman. She had never brought a lawsuit a day in her life. And McDonald's was selling the coffee through the drive through at 180 to 190 degrees. And the reason we know that is because they had a policy or a manual that required them to do that. And coffee at that temperature causes third degree burns, which are the worst kinds of burns that you can have within three to seven seconds of contact. <laughs> so her grandson pulled into a parking spot. She tried to open that little top to put the cream and sugar in. Actually, she steadied it between her knees on the seat because there weren't any cup holders or flat surfaces um, on, in the car. And when she, um, when she couldn't get the top, that little top off, she opened it and the coffee was so hot it, the cup literally collapsed and the coffee pooled in her in her crotch because it was a, um, a bucket seat. And it caused her so severe burns that she had to have skin grafting, skin taken from her thighs and sewn inside of her. She was in the hospital for a week and then she was incapacitated for almost two years. And all she asked for was the difference between what Medicare paid and what her medical bills were. And McDonald's, although they had paid out over 700 times for people who had been burned by their coffee, they offered her $800 and they never offered her another penny. And the jury was unanimous and they awarded her two days of coffee sales for McDonald's, which turned out to be a large sum. It was 2.7 million at the time. And then the judge reduced the amount to 480,000 but she was subject to a gag order and McDonald's wasn't, so she couldn't speak about what really happened. And the media and McDonald's and the tort reform groups, they all got hold of that case and just blasted it out as being one of these ridiculous cases. And then of course, Seinfeld did an episode on it, right. and Letterman and all that became the joke. She corrects the record the, regarding the personal injury civil justice system. The number of lawsuits and the kinds of lawsuits that I'm talking about in this movie are usually personal injury lawsuits, injury uh, cases where people have been severely injured or injured in some way and then they're trying to, to get compensation from the person or the company that harmed them. And so in those types of cases, first of all, you, we can't stop an individual person from bringing a lawsuit. I mean, that's part of our democracy. We have that as part of our constitution. The question is, is that is that person going to find a lawyer? And is that person who brings a non-meritorious case going to get a verdict from a jury and then hold the verdict from a judge? And so, you know, anybody who's walking down the street and who trips over their own feet, they can wind up bring, uh, bringing a lawsuit and filing it. But it costs money to do that, first of all. And the lawyers who represent people who, do the, who are injured, they only get paid if they win. So it's very unlikely that a lawyer is going to bring very many cases that are non-meritorious because insurance companies aren't throwing money at non-meritorious cases and juries aren't giving verdicts to non-meritorious cases. So, but even if a person were to bring a case like this, and even if a lawyer were to represent that person, 
what's does does the system have checks and balances in it that are what will prevent a person from getting a verdict in a so-called frivolous lawsuit and the answer is absolutely yes first the judge can throw it out and fine the person if in fact it's non-meritorious so that if the person who's being sued says this is a frivolous lawsuit they go to the judge and say judge this is a frivolous lawsuit and then the judge evaluates it and decides whether it is or it isn't and then decides whether that person can move forward and then if the judge even makes a mistake or says yes you can go forward now you've got 12 people sitting on a jury they listen to both sides of the argument and both sides of the case and then they come up come up with a verdict in most states it's a unanimous verdict if it's not unanimous it's like you know nine out of twelve or something but even if the jury gets it wrong and they give a verdict for a frivolous so-called frivolous case which by definition it can't really be frivolous if they've given a verdict and have evaluated it but then let's say that they do then the judge can reduce it like that happened in the McDonald's case and then even if it gets past the judge now there are two appeals one after the other and so the, the chances of there being a verdict or a large amount of money that someone gets for a non-meritorious case is very unlikely. Um, and Got in it. fact, these types of cases, the number of cases that have been brought in the last 10 years, they've declined by 25%. Go to court and to sue. You have to go through a lot of trouble to do it. It affects your life. You're going to be attacked in all kinds of ways. Going to court to gain justice is heroic. There was a gag order issued against the burn victim, but the insurance industry published a distortion of facts across the United States. As a result of the misleading public relations media campaign blitz, laws were passed, further eroding victims' rights across the nation, the subject of our next episode. In this episode, we will discuss how hot coffee demonstrates that caps on lawsuits do nothing more than line the pockets of the wealthy at the expense of taxpayers and at the expense of the most vulnerable of society, the tragically injured. Without examining the situation, it might seem reasonable to place caps on damage awards for personal injury victims. However, with a closer look, you will see that they do nothing more than enrich billionaire companies at the expense of taxpayers and really seriously injured victims. Hot Coffee featured Lisa and Mike Gorley and their twin sons, Colin and Connor. Colin was born with cerebral palsy as a result of medical malpractice. In their story, they discussed detail of the clear medical malpractice, which undeniably caused their son cerebral palsy. When you're pregnant with twins, it's really important to determine how many placentas. When I went in, it should have been immediately followed up with an ultrasound. You, you, you just want to change what happened, knowing that it was preventable. The defendants were insured, and the doctors had been sued for malpractice on two prior occasions, and even afterwards as well. You go before a jury? Yes, yes. How yeah. long did the trial take? Well, it took, it took like seven years to even get to trial, and then the trial was three weeks. Mm -hmm. and, so. and what did the jury decide? The jury found um, Dr. Nola and her group negligent, um, and they awarded um, Colin $5 million for medical and um, $625,000 for pain and suffering. And um, in the state of Nebraska, there's a cap. So the cap, um, there was a total cap on everything. And his projected medical expenses are, were um, $12.4 million. So um, a cap. Wait, so the jury decides whatever they decide. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then the judge just changes the decision. So why do they bring a jury into this to begin with? Or why don't they tell them you can't give more than a certain I mean, amount? I, I'm not sure why they don't do that, but it's it's part of the legal procedure. And that, why does Nebraska have this cap and how many states do? Well, the, the cap like we have in Nebraska that caps both your economic and non-economic damages, there's only four states, three three that do it totally. And Colorado kind of has a, a way around it. If the, like in our case, if the judge would have decided in Colorado that it was the cap was unconstitutional he could have thrown out their their cap and allowed the the verdict to stand but um in other states i think it's um what is it it's nebraska and 
caps that Indiana and Virginia Indiana and Virginia mm -hmm. have hard caps. So what was it capped at? Uh, 1.25 million. And there's nothing you can do about that. Well, what we did, um, our attorney, um, right after the decision came back, we uh, went before the judge and had a hearing and said it's unconstitutional. This, you know, to take away the money he needs for his medical bills and, you know, the rest of his life, he's never going to be able to work. And um, the judge came back and said it was unconstitutional to do that. It, it violated his right to a jury trial. And um, at that point, uh, the, the, the doctor and the insurance companies um, appealed the case to the Nebraska Supreme Court. And um, two year, it took two years for the case to go um, and to be heard, and then it took 15 months for them to come back with a decision. And what they did is they reversed the lower court's decision and said the cap um, is constitutional. And they've upheld it. And they've upheld it. What does it mean if there is a cap? Who ends up paying? Well, and what ended up happening with, with us, our situation, is um, they, Colin, um, we, we had insurance with my husband's employer. And then he um, he lost his job, and I was trying. I couldn't get Colin insurance because they would only insure the three of us um, because of his pre-existing conditions and surgeries and therapies and you know everything. And um, so he ended up on Medicaid. Um, there's a medically handicapped children's waiver that that um, helps take care of the medical. So and the taxpayer pays. Right, yeah. Basically, the right. taxpayers have. Uh, it protects the corporations, mm -hmm. but. Right. And you know the doctors had plenty of insurance. They, her group, and the the organization that owned her group, or um, they had millions of dollars in in insurance mm -hmm. to cover this kind of thing. And they paid their premiums, and the insurance companies contracted, and they have a an obligation to take care of these kind of things. But the the tort laws just let them let them free go free and keep their money. And the taxpayers have to step up and pay. Are for you trying it. to change the law in Nebraska? Yeah, we've we've been lobbying for years in Nebraska to going down to our state senate and talking to all our state senators and now you know they've all kind of switched over now we've had a couple of elections since then and uh, we've gone we've gone back to dc and and lobbied a little bit on the federal levels as well so and what does it mean for all of you to be here for this film that brings you together with other people who are not facing the same thing mm -hmm. but the general idea mm -hmm. of corporations that have taken precedence over people right. who are controlling right. laws. Well, when this happens to you, I mean, most people don't even know what's, what they've done to the, the civil justice system, what's going on. Uh, <laughs> they, they listen to the propaganda and they think, oh yeah, there's all these people filing all these bad lawsuits. And, and so, we, and we, you know, when this happens to you, you realize what's going on and you see it, but the average person doesn't know. And we've been trying to get that word out forever. And well, then, I think this and movie then, does, and does. I thank you very yeah. much for being here with mm -hmm. us. The term tort reform is sold as a cost savings measure to the public, but in essence, it is cost shifting. The insurance industry gets an enormous savings in avoiding a multi-million payout to a deserving family that proved its damages for a painful, disabling, maiming injury for medical bills, lost wages, and severe pain and suffering. But due to caps on damages, the verdict gets erased. The damage cap does nothing to prevent lawsuits or deter frivolous claims because the caps can only be triggered in the event of, an, of a catastrophic award. Damage caps guarantee that the victim will not have enough to pay for his or her medical bills and then will have to seek compensation from Medicaid, Medicare, or other taxpayer-funded re uh, resources. So when taxpayers agree to enact a draconian law like tort reform in the nature of damage caps, in essence, it is a cost-saving measure for billionaire corporations rather than any benefit to the middle class, small businesses, or the public at large. This is part three of a three-part series. In the documentary, Hot Coffee, it profiled the election of an Illinois Supreme Court justice in 2008, in which politics played a critical role 
in electing a judge favorable to big business and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. John Grisham followed his friend, Justice Oliver Diaz, and wrote a book about it called The Appeal. He discussed the book right here. The Appeal was a book I published. It's completely fiction, and it's completely true. It's a story of the purchasing of a Supreme Court seat in Mississippi, and what's happened in this country in the past really 10 years. There's been a uh, well-financed, well-coordinated um, effort on the part of big business uh, and the Chamber of Commerce to purchase seats on Supreme Courts. 30 some odd states elect their judges. And almost all those states have no restrictions as to private money. So you've got uh, some very powerful special interest groups uh, raising lots of money to buy judgeships and the races have become terribly expensive uh, even in small states and the campaigns are incredibly nasty and vicious and and it's a it's kind of a rotten system the u.s chamber mounted a very very large and expensive campaign against me john they interviewed because he wrote the appeal was his book they interviewed him and asked you know if he sort of got the idea for the book, The Appeal, because of what I had gone through, and, and he said, yeah, that served as a part of the inspiration for it. So they don't realize that John had actually served in the Mississippi legislature. Of course, we all know that here in Mississippi, and I tell them that John and I served in the Mississippi House of Representatives together. We actually got to be very good friends at the time, and we've stayed in contact over the years. Justice Diaz met with Amy Goodman of Democracy Now!, just like she met with the previous couple. He discussed not only the millions of dollars that were dumped into his race to beat him by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but also the political assistance given to his opponent by President Bush and Karl Rove. So talk about exactly what happened to you. Um, I, I was appointed by the governor when there was a vacancy on the court and then had to stand for election. Um, I, folks had a chance to observe my uh, judicial record and... Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce decided that they could get a better candidate for their interest rather than me. And they came into Mississippi at a time when this had never been done before and put millions of dollars into the election against me to support my opponent. Um, it, it's uh, sort of, if you're familiar with the Citizens United case at the U.S. Supreme Court recently, corporations were able to contribute massive amounts of money without having to disclose where those funds come from or even how much money they put into the races in Mississippi. And so I was faced with having to run an election with uh, massive amounts of money coming in against me and uh, having to raise the resources on my own to... to, to yeah, you did have to this. disclose who gave you money. I had to disclose every single penny that I raised. I had to disclose who I raised it from, how I spent it. Yet uh, corporations are able to come in and not have to disclose where their money comes from or how they spend it. Yeah, it, it's, it's really a disadvantage for candidates. And it's going to start happening all across the country. This is not unique to Mississippi. This is the trend that's going to happen across the Yet United States. Yet you won. I won. Uh, I did. I, I did win my first election. Uh, we, we were able to prevail. But uh, after the election, uh, the, the U.S. attorney who was appointed by uh, George Bush was a Republican uh, congressman, a guy who got defeated for Congress, and, and George Bush put him in for a U.S. attorney. He then began to investigate Democratic donors to um, judicial races in Mississippi and uh, began a prosecution of me at that time, a, a, a prosecution um, based upon my campaign contributions. And indicted you? And indicted, yes. Um, I was indicted for bribery, actually, based upon the campaign contributions because I had to disclose my campaign contributions. They were able to see who donated. They looked at uh, my largest contributor, which was a very good friend of mine named Paul Miner. Uh, he, was a, he was actually a major Democratic donor across the United States. He was one of John Edwards' um, largest contributors at the time. And uh, they began to he investigate. He co-signed a loan he that you needed to take out to 
challenge the millions that your uh, opponent was getting. Exactly. We weren't able to raise enough to combat this, these millions that were coming in, and so we took out a loan from the bank. Mr. Miner co-signed that loan for my campaign. Uh, because he was such a good friend of mine, I never voted on a single case that he had before the Mississippi Supreme Court or, or me while I was on the bench, yet uh, we were being investigated for bribery. I thought it was I thought it would be an open and shut case. I said, there's no way they could even pursue this. They're going to look at the at the record and they're going to see that I've never even voted on his case. But cases. this took you off the bench? Took me off the bench for over three years. And who replaced you? Well, I had to stand for election again and again the chamber came in, put massive amounts of money against me and uh, I was defeated in the in the second election because of, of uh, well, you could imagine the, the publicity that I'd received while I was on the bench and it was very difficult to overcome that. Well, what happened in the trial? I was completely acquitted in the trial. Uh, the jury found me not guilty of everything. How long um, was the trial? The trial lasted about three months. Three days after I was acquitted, I was re-indicted again. The federal prosecutor said, well, if it's not uh, bribery or, or campaign finance laws, he must, have dis he must have not properly disclosed this on his income, so we're going uh, to indict him for income tax evasion now. Um, I was tried again, completely acquitted. Jury was out for about 15 minutes and found me not guilty of everything again. But you lost the race. But, but did lose the race in the second time, yes. Did Karl Rove play any role in this? Because we have followed the case of the former Alabama governor, Don Siegelman, yes. uh, who went to jail, um, and Rove played a key role. Yes. Uh, you, you would be surprised at the similarities in the cases. Uh, we've we've since learned that this is sort of a the mo that uh, the Rove and and the his machine actually used. They they came into the state of Texas and took over the Supreme Court there. Alabama they did the same thing and they they used that as a launching pad to sort of uh, pick off state Supreme Court justices all around the country uh, using that model. I think until really hot coffee came out that nobody had stepped back and tried to look at the broad picture and you know you were accused of bribery but did you ever do anything in return for that and and why would they go through with the prosecution if they ultimately found out that that you know you had never done anything so it, it's you know I don't want to criticize the media too much because it's hard to take a broad picture while it's going on but um, but I think still to this day nobody's really done a, a, a really sort of in-depth look as far as the print media or anything like that. It's a good payoff. You put money in a judicial race, it can have literally a million dollar impact on your company. I want to state that notwithstanding my criticism in these videos, that I am in favor of judicial elections. Were it not for elections, you'd have a situation where only the financially powerful would make appointments and claim that they were making merit selections. In my opinion, the solution is controlling money in politics. Mandatory arbitration clauses are ways that employers, mega wealthy, and powerful corporations have removed accountability from their behavior, a role that the judicial system had previously played an effective part. Hot Coffee profiled a case involving a rape at Halliburton in which an employee had to fight merely to receive her day in court. She was drugged. She was raped, gang raped. She had to have reconstructive surgery, sir. Ms. Jones has had her day in court. Four years to fight to get in court is not a day in court. Samantha B. took an in-depth look at forced arbitration causes focusing on sexual harassment claims. The name of our bill is Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment. So what is forced arbitration? Besides what I assume is a thrilling USA Network drama in its seventh season, <laughs> it's something we pay even less attention to. From day one of many jobs, that prioritization and silencing of those who come forward begins. New employee onboarding materials, as you heard, often include these mandatory arbitration clauses that employees don't even know are there. Mandatory arbitration silences victims. It limits opportunity. 
It protects powerful men and it breaks the leadership ladders that we are all working so hard to put in place to help women succeed. First arbitration is a legal strategy that allows corporations to bypass the court system. When companies do bad stuff, they can force accusers to use a private arbitrator hired by that same company with little chance to appeal when the arbitrator rules in favor of the company, which it usually does. Just about anything you do can be subject to forced arbitration and you might not even know it because it's buried in those terms and conditions you don't bother to read before downloading that app that tells you which fish you look like. <laughs> You've likely signed away your legal recourse for any disputes that arise if you got overcharged on your Uber or got kicked out of an Airbnb for sleeping while black or tried to get identity theft protection from that company that basically told hackers, hey, here's almost everyone's personal information, go have fun. Forced arbitration literally takes away your legal rights. It can circumvent the courts on claims based on the civil rights Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Forced arbitration often mandates non-disclosure agreements. Not only does that keep stories from getting out to the public, it can also prevent employees from sharing information about mutually feared creepos. And that enabled monsters like Roger Ailes to continue subjecting women to his genitals. Can you tell me what happened to you? I can't tell you any of the details, unfortunately. And that's because. And that's because in society we've chosen two ways to resolve sexual harassment cases, and they're both secret. One is settlements where the women can never tell you what happened, mm -hmm. and the other is forced arbitration, which is also a secret chamber, so women can never tell you what happened. So the first rule of forced arbitration is don't talk about forced arbitration. <laughs> but I can say hypothetically, if a woman's being sexually harassed in the workplace and she has an arbitration clause, she screwed. Senator Elizabeth Warren spoke out against forced arbitration clauses related to the finance sector. She gave the following speech on the Senate floor in the context of imploring the Senate to vote in favor of keeping a rule banning forced arbitration clauses in consumer agreements. Here's the issue. If you have a checking account or credit card or a private student loan or any number of financial products, there's a good chance that you have given up your right to go to court if that financial firm cheats you. And that's because tens of millions of consumer financial contracts include a forced arbitration clause that says that if this financial company cheated you, you can't join with other consumers in court. You have to go to arbitration by yourself. Tens of millions of consumers, including around 80 million credit card customers, can't go to court if their banks cheat them. Now, think about what that means in the real world. You wake up one morning, you find a mysterious $30 fee on your account statement. You call the bank and you say, hey, I didn't agree to this. The bank tells you, pound sand. So what are your options? Well. If there's no forced arbitration clause in your contract, you have a choice. You can go to court, or if your bank offers it, you can pursue arbitration. Now, here's what you want to think about. Chances are pretty good that if the bank cheated you with a $30 unauthorized fee, that there are other customers in the same boat. And that means, if you want, you can join a class action lawsuit against the bank for free. A class action gives you a chance to get some money back, and it doesn't cost you anything. A class action also means the bank might have to cough up some real money and think twice before hitting you and their other customers with hidden fees the next time around. Now think about what happens if there is a forced arbitration clause. You can't join with the other customers in court. Your only option is to file a solo arbitration claim, which will cost you $200 or more just to get started. Who's going to pay $200 up front to try to get back a $30 fee? No one. And that's exactly what the banks are counting on. They can get away with nickel and diming you forever. But say the bank steals a bigger amount. And you just can't stand it anymore, so you decide to be one of the roughly 400 consumers a year to go before an arbitrator. If you don't like the result, there's no appeal. Even worse, the banks are allowed to swipe your wallet in secret. 
The records of these proceedings are not public, so the regulators and the American people don't get to know what the banks are up to. Is this only justice in America? Companies like Equifax and Wells Fargo have hurt millions of consumers and then turn around and try to escape accountability using forced arbitration clauses. Even though there's a rule currently in place banning forced arbitration clauses in contracts between banks and consumers, it's a constant legal battle to preserve the consumer rights, as bank lobbyists are persistently trying to revoke consumer rights to sue and remove any accountability for financial institutions. With forced arbitration clauses, even if you have a meritorious claim and it's cost effective, and even if you want to take the time to bring a company who cheated you to arbitration, chances are you'll lose anyway. The company stacked the deck in their favor. Fairness. Some say arbitration panels aren't. What it does is suppress any bad claims against them so and keeps them in secret. So and and they're not held accountable. According to a study by Public Citizen, companies win arbitration cases as much as 95% of the time. So what can you do about this? Not much. Gretchen Carlson, formerly of Fox News, spoke out against forced arbitration clauses in the sexual harassment employment context and makes a call to action that citizens get involved on the state and local level. What else can we do? So people can get involved on the local level. They can change laws locally. They can change laws at the state level. They can call their members of Congress. If there was ever a time to do that, the time is now. Collectively, our voice is so much stronger than just one person. The right to a jury trial is a sacred right meant to level the playing field between the weak and the poor and the powerful. The courts are a place where injured people can get money for injuries caused by the politically strong. Damage caps, unlimited campaign donations to judicial candidates, and forced arbitration clauses seriously erode this important right and further widen the gap between the ultra wealthy and the weakening middle class. The right to a fair jury trial and fair elections should not be reduced. They should be protected. The legal system can be reformed without removing this important right. I hope you liked this video. Please watch other educational legal videos on my YouTube channel.